today we're going to be discussing how to choose and train your own dog or, or choosing a dog, whether it's a rescue, usually a rescue dog, but this, if you are thinking about getting a purebred dog, uh, this, a lot of this stuff will apply to you as well. Are, did, are you thinking about getting a dog or do you already have one? Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's great. Um, so a little bit about me and, and maybe why I got into dog training. I, uh, uh, I got into dog training because of this guy right here, uh, Jet. And he's over here on the left, over here. And uh, we brought, I wasn't a trainer at this time, and, and uh, we brought Jet home. And he was, uh, I thought I knew everything about dog training. And, and even though I wasn't a trainer, I did lots of reading. We brought him home, and he would not look at me. He would just simply go into a corner or go into a crate that we had for him, and he would barely eat. And this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I finally did solicit the help of a dog, dog trainer at the time, and she helped me out. But I really had to wait a long time. And she advised me, this trainer advised me, to wait a long time to get this dog used to. Um, used to me and the family and everything like that. And um, he made lots and lots of progress. And uh, at that point, I thought this is really neat. And I started volunteering at the Pet Alliance of Orlando and really got, got, got into an assistant position there as a volunteer to assist the, the behaviors there. And uh, that's when I decided I was gonna go back to school. Um, uh, study and then work under the tutelage of a mentor and then I of course I since then I've been working with hundreds and hundreds of dogs and this other dog over here is my puppy Shana on the left there on my left and then over here she's now 73 pounds uh, a big dog very very happy that was after became I became a trainer unfortunately with Jet I think I created a little bit more baggage uh, with him because I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, so this is what we'll cover. The, the, the whole thing is, this whole presentation is about 40 minutes long or so. We'll be, we'll be, first we'll be covering choosing a dog or a puppy and we're going to be considering the breed. Uh, we're going to make sure you have the time to take care of a dog. Uh, and uh, what you'll need when you get a dog, this will be good for you too because you guys are thinking about getting a dog. And that's what was really confusing to me. Uh, when, before I got a dog. Of course, socialization, and the last thing we're probably going to hit is training and how that's changed over the years. And then we'll have some questions at the end. You can ask me as many questions as you want. Um, so let's start right here with choosing a dog. Uh, you got to choose your breed very, very carefully, especially if you're, if you're thinking about a purebred dog, because dogs do have, uh, they were bred for jobs. And uh, here's a good example here. Uh, this is a Border Collie, and uh, they're gorgeous, gorgeous dogs, beautiful. And uh, people choose them just for looks. And I advise people not to choose a dog just for looks. I mean, you want a pretty dog. You want a dog that you're attracted to. But you don't want to necessarily choose a dog just for its looks. And these dogs are difficult for novice dog owners. Um, they require tons of mental stimulation, tons of exercise. You better get this dog out with a Frisbee or a plain fetch. Uh, and then after you're done with that for uh, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes, or even an hour, depending on the dog, uh, then maybe at night when you get home from work, you better decide that you're going to do some mental stimulation, some smelling work or something like that. They need lots of stimulation. And if they don't get it, they are destructive in the house. They can, they've been known to be very, very destructive. Um, so that's something to consider. I mean, we want to consider uh, certain exotic breeds. This is a Cane Corso. And uh, I had a client at one point, or a potential client. Uh, if I had gotten her, I was going to advise that we, she rehome the dog because she had one of these. these. It was a puppy. She had three very young children, and she had this dog as a puppy. And this, this was, puppy was in its adolescence, which I'll talk, talk to you about soon. Uh, and it was just a terror. And these dogs need tons and tons of training and structure right at puppyhood. And if you happen to rescue a dog that is sort of has this in its mixture, you better be thinking about that, whether the dog got socialized correctly and was trained uh, well enough in puppyhood, because otherwise you can be, have a really difficult dog with you. Uh, and of course, you really want to consider <laughs> the size of your dog. Let's say you live in an apartment. I think this is considered the 
the uh, biggest dog in the world. I forgot what this, this Great Dane, was, his name was, but he's huge. And uh, if you live in an apartment, you don't want to have a dog like this, of course. Uh, it's just uh, too big, and the, the clients that I've had who have Great Danes, they have a big old mattress as a dog bed. They are that big. Uh, they're wonderful dogs, though, if you have the space. You have, and of course, this is the pit bull. This is a very popular breed around here. Uh, again, consider where you live. If you live in an apartment, you don't want to be getting a pit bull because chances are they're going to make you get rid of it because it's not allowed, even though a pit bull really is just a dog. I, dog is a dog is a dog is a dog, generally. Uh, we do have breed characteristics, um, but, but uh, generally they aren't as dangerous as what, what we, you know, um, how we think of them. Uh, so, but they are extremely happy, crazy dogs, the ones that I've ever dealt with. And as you can see in this funny picture here. Uh, so they need tons and tons of exercise. Not so much mental stimulation, but lots of exercise. So get that dog out walking a lot. Uh, so do you have time? Uh, you gotta make sure you have time. If you are a regular person that, that works eight hours a day, uh, perfect. But if you work 11, 12 hours a day, maybe a dog's not for you. It's, it, it takes lots and lots of time. Uh, just spending time with your dog. Not, and it's not so much training. Training doesn't take that long. But spending time with your dog, and it's, to be away from your dog for that long, maybe you should consider a, a cat. Because <laughs> cats can be on their own. Uh, so definitely make sure you have the time to train and, uh, to train and spend time with your dog. Uh, also, when you consider a dog, make sure you also consider vet bills and grooming. If you have a dog that needs grooming, we're talking about 50, 40, 30, 40, 50 dollars uh, every six weeks or so. So it can be expensive. So if you don't want to pay for that, get a dog that doesn't require grooming. Um, there's also the, uh, the vet bills. If don't consider two dogs uh, unless you are an experienced dog owner because not, number one, it's very expensive vet-wise, especially if you're getting two, two puppies, but also you need to train them separately. So uh, consider all that. Uh, here's my dog, Shana. She was in the cone of shame, oh, I don't know, uh, I think it was three times she was in the cone of shame. When we adopted her, she had a botched surgery and uh, uh, on a, a spaying, so we had to get that redone. She was in the cone of shame once. The second time, she, she, um, she had a growth plate problem in her arm, and uh, so that was very costly, thousands of dollars. And then the third time, she thought an indoor window in her house was, uh, was open and it was closed and she was hungry and she walked, ran right through the window and cut her wrist, and that's this cut her wrist right here. And this is, she was getting so good with the cone of shame getting to that, that I had to put another inflatable cone on it. She was just, uh, she was miserable, unfortunately. And another thing to consider is the adolescent year. So I work at, now I work at the Orange County Animal Services, which I really love. It's, it's, it's a place that I really love volunteering at. Uh, so the dogs there in every shelter I've ever worked at, uh, they are mostly are adolescents. Six months to two years is adolescence. And uh, they test owners. And if you don't do your homework before six months, which is what I'll tell you about a little bit coming up in training, uh, then you have a monster on your hands. You have a dog that just wants to stick, your, stick his tongue out at you. So be aware of that. Um, so when I first got Jet, I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a planner. I like to plan things out, and, and I, I, I was really confused. And you can get very confused on the internet as what you really need for, for when you first bring home a dog. And you really don't need a lot. This, this is pretty much the entire list. So uh, we'll start with a crate. If you're going to get a puppy, for instance, you'll want to have a crate uh, and condition the, the, the dog or the puppy to the crate. Uh, or if you have an adolescent dog, if you adopt an adolescent dog, you'll, you'll want to try to condition them to the crate because it'll keep you sane, especially a puppy. You want a dog to, uh, to go to a place that's not punishment, to go to a place that, that they can relax and calm down, especially with puppies. Um, 
I had a client on Wednesday night. He's a doctor and he just got a golden retriever puppy and they could not get the dog into the, to the crate. Well, they didn't condition the dog correctly to the crate. They didn't make the crate a fun place to be. And they had actually had checked out a number of other trainers and they had said, they had told, told them wrongly, you, you've got to punish the dog by putting it in the crate. No, we don't want that. We want the, that to be a safe haven for them to be. And uh, this is kind of the reason why, and these are the two different kinds of crates you can get generally. Uh, Dogs are descended from wolves, and wolves, when they go to sleep, they find a small cave-like area. And, uh, and dogs have taken on that as well. We've studied dogs out in, who are wild dogs or feral dogs who run around in neighborhoods and don't have a home. When they sleep, they tend to find a small protected space. That's what this concept is, and that's why these crates are probably the best. The only problem with these crates are that they, um, they are expensive. And as you get a puppy, you need to get them bigger and bigger and bigger because you don't want to have too large a crate. I've had clients who get one of those big wire crates and they think they're going to get, they're going to, the dog's going to grow into it. Well, that's not the idea. The idea is to make it small, cozy, and they won't defecate, pee or poop in the, in the crate. Um, the wire crates are fine too. They just aren't quite as cave-like but they, they seem to work just fine. And I had those same clients who had the Golden Retriever, they put a big blanket over their wire crate. The great thing about those is they're economical. So you, can, you can expand them, you don't have to keep buying them, you can make them smaller for the puppy when they're small and as they get bigger. And that's exactly what we did with Shana. And then when Shana became about a year old, we, we got rid of the crate, we never used it again. And we put it away and we, we probably won't now, she just wanders around in the house fine. Um, so let's go back to the, what we need. So chew toys, if you get a pit bull, for instance, or if you get a, um, a golden retriever, they want to chew. So get a bunch of chew toys. Don't put them all out at, at the same time, uh, uh, but rotate them so that there's always some kind of a good, good uh, new thing to play with. Uh, you want to get good quality food, and this is what you'll discuss with your vet. Uh, but I use just middle-of-the-road food. I don't use the really expensive food. I don't do this raw diet. I don't get the cheap Walmart stuff. It's just, I think it was Purina Pro Plan is what I use. And I've been using that for about a year. It, it agrees with them, their systems. They, uh, it's, it's just a good all-around food, and it's just, it's, it's right in the middle. Uh, collar tag and microchip. And of course, uh, when you get a collar and a tag, and I, th I don't think I can tell you folks here because you're, you're younger than me, but some of the older folks, uh, you'll want to have, this is for some of the older folks, you'll want to have a, uh, your cell phone on the tag. Because let's say you haven't bonded to your dog and your dog gets out, you want to be able to uh, have someone call your cell phone. You'll be out looking for your dog and you don't want them to call your home. So, but I don't have to tell you guys that. You guys probably don't even have a home phone. <laughs> and then microchip, of course, that's a, that's a really good thing to have as well. Uh, because if the dog is completely lost, or if you have an expensive breed, you went and got a purebred dog, uh, you'll want to protect it, you know, because they will automatically scan when, they, when, you, when you go into a new vet, for instance, and they can, they can find your dog for you. Uh, a leash, so let's talk a little bit about leashes. So. A lot of small dog owners, dog owners have these, it's a retractable lead. These are okay, but honestly, if you ever want your dog to walk beside you, you should never buy this. If you don't care, you know, I see a lot of dogs that go all the way to the end, 25 feet or whatever it is, but if, if, you don't, if you don't want your dog to walk beside you, then go ahead and use it. But honestly, I, when I come to people, they, they're, they, I, a common, issue is leash pulling. And the first thing I have them do is take this and throw it out uh, because they, they really teach a dog just to pull. So don't use one of these retractable leashes. So a simple six foot lead like this, of course, is just fine, all right? And there is a technique to holding a leash. Uh, you, it's usually a two-handed method um, and halfway down the leash and use the handle. You don't do that with it but you actually do this. And you teach a dog to walk on your side, uh, and you don't, it, some people say, you gotta walk your dog on the left. Nope, it doesn't matter. You can w walk it on the left, you can walk it on the right, but you should choose a side when you get your dog. It should be a left or right. And with my dogs, 
Jet is always on the right, and Shane is always on the left. And if they get discombobulated or something gets screwed up, they always come back because they're so used to walking left and right there. So, um, and with them, it's, it's a little unique with them because I have a six foot lead that I have a lot of times with Shana over here, and then I will grab the handle and use a four foot lead for Jet. And so I still carry them or move them through this way. So it's simple, six foot lead, that's all you need. Um, oh, uh, so here's some optional stuff. I'll get to the front attaching harness in a second. But of course, a tree pouch is always great, especially when, we get, when I tell you about training. Uh, you'll want to have one of these. these. This is probably about 10 bucks. Um, but you can have these, these, of course, deluxe ones. This is about 16 bucks or something. I like this. I mean, I keep on buying these. Of course, I get these cheap because I'm a dog trainer. <laughs> but uh, these are really great. And they're about, they're about $16 in the store. So they're pretty cheap. Uh, and here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Some people don't know what a clicker is. It's simply just a noisemaker. And I use this a lot with my aggressive cases. And, because, um, and all it does is take the place of saying good girl or good boy or yes. Uh, and um, it always is followed with a treat. And um, it's really precise. So the minute the dog sits, you click and then you give him a treat. And then that's, uh, it's, it's a great way of training dogs. I don't have all my clients use these because then it's not necessary. But with, with dogs that are really crazy, this is a great tool because it's, it, it's a quick sound. They get it right away. Or for aggressive dogs that we're trying to make you calm down. So we're clicking and treating when, you, when you're calm. Um, so, and I, there's some stuff I don't want you to get. Let me get into that. Well, I'll show you. This, this, is, this is a really a torture device. This is called a prong collar. And um, they really do, the problem is, is, the, is, is when you use these things and you want your dog to walk closely to you and you want to cause pain, they can associate that pain with something else out in the environment. So you could do a nice leash pop on this and it could really hurt. And then some kids might be walking across the street, and he might associate that pain. Or it could be a friendly dog, and every time he wants to pull to be, be friendly with someone, he could start associating co this constant thing over the course of weeks or months that everybody that I want to greet is painful, so now I'm going to get aggressive about it. And I don't like these people anymore. So I don't like these things, and I'll tell you why when we get into the training part. And this is a small choke chain. Uh, same thing, same exact concept, it just never stops and you pull harder and causes more pain. And I'll show you why, uh, in a little bit, why pain is not necessarily good. Uh, and so let's get to the front attaching harness. This is a great tool for, um, for, for uh, teaching a dog to walk nicely on a leash without pulling. What it does is it attaches in the front. And if the dog does move a little ahead, he starts to pull up a little bit and he can no longer look forward. Uh, and so that little bit of discomfort, uh, a lot of dogs I've seen all of a sudden, okay, I get it. I'm gonna stay right here. Especially some of these dogs, small, you can use it on a small dog. My mother-in-law used it on her poodle, 15 pounds, her miniature poodle, and uh, worked like a charm. I didn't even have to teach that dog to walk nicely. Um, if you first get a dog or a puppy, I would suggest that you do not get a food bowl. And the reason why, we're trying to bond with our dog. Uh, so what, we, what I like to see people do, especially if they have a puppy, is you can burn through their entire meal just by feeding them, a, feed them by hand. Sit, give them a morsel. Sit, give them a morsel. Do that, do that 25 times and make them go down. 25 times, you know, and give them a treat. And you're bonding with your dog and you're training your dog at the same time and feeding them and you're showing them who is in control of the resources. I am. I control the resources. Uh, and that's a big part of modern day dog training now. So don't get a food bowl yet. You can get it a little later. And of course, when you go to the shelter, uh, adopting is, and this, this is sort of the case for puppies as well, but not so much because you can kind of mold a puppy the way you want it if you train correctly. Uh, but adopting an adult dog or an adolescent dog is like a box of chocolates. It's, it's, you never know what you're going to get. A, a prime example is my dog, Jet. Um, 
He's now a completely different dog than when, he, when we first got him. He was shy, he never barked. Now he barks at the door, which we like. It's like our alarm system. Um, and uh, so, and I, I've noticed, a I get a lot of calls from clients because their dog has changed. They got their dog three months ago and now my dog is crazy. You know, he wasn't crazy at first. So it, he, they, your dog will change. And also most Gret rescues do have some sort of baggage. Uh, you'll, you'll notice there's some things you can, you can help them get through it, other things you just have to manage, you know. But the, a lot of times the reason why these dogs are, are relinquished is because of behavior. It's a very common issue. Uh, so well, many times you can work through it. Other times, if, especially with fear and anxiety or, or some kind of a socialization problem, uh, you can only manage it, you know, especially by the time you, the, by the time they get, become adults. So when you first get your dog or your puppy, uh, don't ogle over it. Get, get it trained right away. And I don't know why I chose this picture, but I guess these ladies are training their dog. Maybe a dog, I don't know. <laughs> I should maybe get a different picture. But uh, yeah, definitely train right from the start. So train, uh, especially your puppy, like with going back to that food bowl thing. Just train, 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 and you're developing a great bond with your dog. Um, just a few pointers on rescue dogs specifically. So if you, like I said, your dog will change after a few months, chances are. Uh, if you have a shy or stress, you know, shy or, or anxious dog, don't push them too much. Um, when I brought Jet home and he was very anxious and fearful, the trainer told me rightly that I should just take it easy. Don't try to train him right away. Uh, that would be an exception to the rule. So you don't want to stress him out. Um, because when a dog doesn't eat, chances are it's stressed out, especially if it's a food-motivated dog. Uh, but definitely with those hyper-crazy dogs, which are my favorites because they're so trainable, um, you want to train right away. Control all the resources. Control, you know, uh, modern dog training is about controlling petting and praise and, and, and food and all this stuff. You want to want them to work for it. No free lunch. Is, is what we well, I'd like to say. Um, so those are a few pointers. So let's get into dog training. Uh, yeah, I wish my class looked that good. <laughs> I do teach classes, and uh, none of they're all rescues, which is good, but, but that's a beautiful picture. So um, this is what every dog should know, and I don't care if you have a big old Mastiff dog or you have a little Chihuahua, you want these, you want to have these skills in your dog's toolbox. So sit, sit, stay. Everything derives from the sit, by the way. Uh, sit, uh, and even in trek training, you want them to come back to a sit. When we get into advanced walking, where they're walking beside you and you stop, we want them to sit automatically. So sit is a very important thing. Of course, stay is great. Uh, we want to have them stay before they go out the door. Uh, and a come, I teach come in a different way. A lot of times when you go to a, a class at, let's say, one of the big box stores or something like that, they'll teach sit first, and then they'll say stay, and you'll, they'll, they'll do this. And then they'll do come, you know. But I like to teach it in a different way. Um, actually, I was, meaning, I was meaning come, actually, not stay. Um, I like the dogs to wander around on their own and then call them to you. So I might let the dog wander a little bit and then say, Rover, come, like this, and get him to come to me. And I want it to be happy, and I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be militaristic like this. I want them to just to come uh, when I'm excited, and, and it, it, I want to entice them to come to me. And the reason why we do that, to let them smell around and get, in, get into their own world, is because that's when you're gonna use it. You're gonna use it when they're out in the field, and you want them to come, and, and you, um, it, it won't be when they're from a, doing it from a sit. So I like, to, I like to do that when they've gotten into their own smelling game or starting to, to wander off. And I'm always reinforcing the come command with my dogs. For, so for instance, I will usually many times walk them around the block and then go to an open park. This is not a dog park, but it's an underutilized park in my neighborhood. So I'll let them wander off. And uh, I like to, every once in a while, and I'll have treats in my treat pouch, and every once in a while, I like to just call them, give them a treat, and let them go off again. And the reason why I do that, because when I really want them to come, you know, then they will definitely come, because they think, we're gonna get a treat, or we might get a treat. 
And so they're playing the lottery, which is, or, or playing the slot machine. I mean, we might or might not get a treat, so let's check. So you really want to have a very reliable comm. And of course, once you've developed that structure with the, the sit, sit, stay, come, down, down, stay, then we can really work on, on uh, walking loosely on a leash. And walking loosely on a leash is different from a heel. Sometimes I will teach a client to, to get the dog to heel first, but healing is actually walking and looking at, the dog, looking at the owner like that. That is actually a heel, or being very attentive on, on the owner walking right here and in a very strict place. But walking, loose leash walking is simply having the dog in a space near you so the dog is walking loosely. So you could, y'all could be going up there just as long as the leash is loose and my dogs will know. You know, they, they know they can, they, where they can go. They can go back a little bit. It can always be a little loose. Um, but they know that once they get to the, the point where it starts to get tight, that's where, where the fun stops. I stop and I don't go anywhere. So um, there's a difference between the two. But some clients I will teach heel first because like for instance, this one client wants to have his dog walk off leash with him. So I'll teach the heel first off leash in the house. We do it and then we'll get them to do that and then we'll get them to um, uh, slowly, methodically get them to come up beside us and not necessarily be so strict and then once we get that in the house and we get it outside the house as well, then we add the leash to it. It's, it's a thing called back chaining. And uh, so the, 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 the lead gets put on at that point and the dog already knows, oh, it's, it's very rewarding to be here right beside my owner. So there's, dog training can be like, we have to use a lot of science, a lot of psychology, but there's, there's also an art to it. And every dog is different. So let's get into training now. So there's two different methods of training. I'm sure you're all familiar with the punishment-based method. That's where a dog learns by being punished. And then there's the reward-based system, which has been around for about 30 years, where the dog learns, to, uh, learns all his commands through being rewarded. And, and uh, he, the, the, the undesirable behaviors are ignored. Uh, in the punishment-based method, uh, we, we use these devices like the prong collar to really hurt the dog, to train the dog to make sure he stays where he wants to go. Both will train the dog. They are both successful. They are both training methods. Um, the problem is with the punishment bait train, training, and we've done a lot of research on this, uh, there are side effects. So the result is, you can see on my my chart here, the result that the dogs do get trained both ways. Uh, but the side effects for that, especially for uh, some really what we call soft dogs, which are very anxious or fearful dogs, they become more fearful. They can become aggressive. Now, a lot of times aggressive dogs, I'm going to say, I'm throwing this number out. I'm not sure if it's right stats wise, but 90% of dogs who are aggressive are fearful. So uh, you create fear, you create fear of the owner, the owner becomes a threat, uh, and they can get anxiety. And of course, if you, if you pull hard enough on this thing, and you actually do have to pull this thing very hard in order to get your dog to comply, uh, you can injure your dog, especially if you have uh, a brachiocephalic dog, which is a dog that's like a pug that has a nose punched, and they, can, they have very delicate necks. Um, the side effects for reward-based, there are none. Uh, so, and in both things, timing, is, both training methods, timing is really, really important. Uh, so when you, when you, when your dog in, in the, the punishment-based system, I should say physically punishing, uh, because we, in, in the reward-based system, we still punish. We don't physically and hurt them. We don't create fear. Uh, but in the physical punishment training method, which is what we've used for 50, 100 years, um, if your timing is off, uh, you could uh, injure the dog, you could, you, could, you could create more fear than it actually thinks. So if I take this and I yank on this hard enough um, and my timing is not right, the dog will, or it's not hard enough, for instance. Let's say you, have, you do use this on a pit bull. You might 
do that and it might not be hard enough, he'll go, what's that? And he'll desensitize to it. Um, and then your timing has to be absolutely correct. In reward-based training, it, timing is very, very important as well. So when the dog, you get the dog into a sit, and what we do in reward-based system is we, especially at the start, we take a treat and we move it over its head so it has to sit. You have to deliver that treat and deliver what's called a marker, which is like the clicker, or saying good girl or yes. Uh, you have to say it immediately to, to convey to the dog what they did was right. So timing has to be perfect. Um, so a lot of people, they'll wait. The dog will sit, and then they'll wait. And then they'll give them a treat. So the dog will not understand, why am I getting a treat? You, you, timing is important. So when the timing is off, you, of course, get those side effects. But when your timing is off in the reward-based system, the only thing that happens is the undesirable behavior continues. So it's, it's, it's harmless, basically. Uh, and you aren't harming the dog emotionally. So now you can tell what kind of a trainer I am. I've really done my research and really gone to school, and this is, this is the method of choice, the reward-based system. We are trying to phase out the old system, trying to educate people. And this is why I like doing these presentations. We're trying to educate people on, on the fact that this is so much of a better system, and it's just as quick. Um, and this, this actually just makes it worse. So a lot of people send their dogs to a board and train facility, and all the board and train facilities that I know of here in Orlando use these e-collars. They've renamed them e-collars because shock collar sounds too awful. And they are. It is awful. So we are, we're talking, going back to the punishment-based system, where uh, I was talking about the prong collar and how a dog can associate something else with that pain. This is the same thing and even worse. So let's say your dog doesn't come back to you, so you have your remote and you have your shock collar there, the dog's not coming back, and you know that if you shock them, they're gonna come at that point. Uh, the problem is, is, the, is having that, that um, just that anticipation of getting a shock is, is, creates anxiety in, in any kind of a human being. Uh, or any kind of a, a organism, I should say. Uh, they could also associate the shock. So you shock them, you know they're gonna come back, but there's a bunch of kids, or there's a guy in a wheelchair over here, or there's a tall guy with a, black, with a, with a beard, uh, some, something unusual. They might associate wheelchairs, for instance, with that shock, uh, because it really is single event learning. It's not, it's not methodical learning. Um, I think all in all, I think I can, I can, I can give you an analogy about the two different methods. Um, so let's say a, a child has a tutor, and he comes to this teacher, his parents bring him to this teacher, and uh, okay, little Johnny, we're gonna have you, um, we're gonna give you a little test, and uh, you're gonna have 10 questions. So he does the 10 questions, and every time he gets a wrong question, he gets a slap on the wrist with a, with a, with a ruler, and it really hurts. Uh, but when, when he gets the answers right, okay, doesn't really say much. Um, so little Johnny, week after week, he's going to start to get anxious. He's going to start to be stressed, and he's going to uh, he's not going to like the teacher. The teacher is he's going to hate the teacher's teacher. And after week after week after week for this, he's going to have so much stress that he's going to be having tantrums in the car when they go there. It's a really stress. But he's going to learn. He will learn. He will learn to avoid that punishment. Um, now, let's do it the other way. So Johnny comes into the, the, um, with the tutor, and he gets seven out of 10 right. So for, he gets seven pieces of chocolate. And so every time he gets one run right, he gets a piece of chocolate. But the three that gets wrong, the, the tutor says nothing, ignores him, uh, and, and that's it. Uh, Johnny will love, number one, and, and uh, one more thing, when Johnny gets the chocolate, the, the tutor goes, yes, you did great, but when Johnny doesn't get, get the, the answer wrong, the, the tutor doesn't do anything, he just sort of, okay. 
you know, so, so he will learn because he wants to get more chocolate. So he, um, he, number one, he will love the teacher because I'm getting all this chocolate. He will love coming in to get tutored because I'm getting this reward and he will definitely learn and he will not have those tantrums. So that's kind of an example of the two different systems and how the, the new system, I feel, is so much better. So when you get your, get your puppy, those of you who are thinking of getting a puppy, make sure you consider socialization. I chose this picture because there's all sorts of, there's other dogs there, there's children. Uh, we are getting dogs used to all sorts of situations. So between, uh, eight, between eight, and, uh, eight and 12 weeks, well, I'll get to that in a second. Puppies especially, between eight and 12 weeks, need to uh, have this, this lack of a fear imprint period. And so uh, what they are doing is, is, um, is the, the, between that time, there's a window where you can really get them used to all sorts of things, people, skateboards, bikes. Uh, if they miss that window, you can never get it back. You can still socialize your dog, but uh, you can never get that wonderful window where they are scared of nothing. So uh, that's when, and this is an example of a dog that has not been socialized well. It's, it's between its owner's knees, and uh, it's at, probably at a farmer's market or some sort of dog park or something, and it's just scared. And I recommend to people that they, if they do have dogs that are scared of farmer's markets and big crowds, just don't bring them. And my dog, Jet, I don't bring him. It's not, for, it's, it's not good for him, he doesn't like it. Uh, and why am I doing it? I don't, I don't need to bring, I don't need to show off my dog. Shana, no problem, we went through all that. Uh, he, she has no problems with big crowds. So uh, be aware that socialization is not just uh, getting, getting used to other dogs, which a lot of people think, that's only part of it. It's getting, getting the dog used to uh, other situations and people and children especially. So between eight and 12 weeks is ideal. You don't want to miss it. Some vets say, don't get your dog out. They could get diseases. Well, yeah, you want to stay away from the pet stores and the dog parts if you have a dog that's eight weeks old. But that, you can still get your dog out to, in front of Publix. We went down to the loop down in Kissimmee and just sat. And every person wants to, to pet a puppy, no matter what it is. Everybody does. And so that's where you want them getting used to all sorts of noises and things. And, and you want to be feeding them constantly. You want to associate these, these potentially scary things with food, with really good food. Uh, so between eight and 12 weeks, I like the, the milestone of 100 strangers. And that's exactly what we did. We counted. We went down. We got her at 10 weeks. And we, so we had to rush it. But we went down to the loop uh, and went to Walmart. We sat outside of Publix. And we counted 100 strangers over, that period, over the period of two weeks. And that's the reason why she's not scared of anybody, and Jet is, because Jet was never quite socialized like that, we believe. We don't really know, because I got him at about 10 months. Um, unfortunately, if you miss that 8 to 12 week, you will be playing catch up, and chances are you'll never get your dog really, really used to every possible situation. Um, I do lots of work with clients who are, the dogs are scared of skateboards, they're scared of bikes, they're scared of wheelchairs. So get, get your dogs out to avoid that. That's a preventative measure. Uh, and of course, any dog between eight and 12 weeks, they probably have, already have not had all their shots. So stay away from pet stores or dog parks. But try to ignore your vet if you happen to have a vet who's not quite informed about training that, that, that you really, this window is very, very important. And, and it's unlikely that they can get a deadly disease such as parvo if they're out in a, in a, let's say, a, oh, a Home Depot or something like that, which I used to do too. I used to go into Home Depot. And there's a place called Artagon, which is down, uh, you know where Artagon is? Down, down the street a bit. It's, it's um, yeah, near Millennia area. You can bring your dog right in that mall. Perfect place. Perfect place. And, uh, so I'm just imploring people, don't miss that crucial window. I, I think you could probably push it to 16 weeks, but when they start to get kind of scared, they've, they've reached a fear imprint period. That's what we call it. And uh, this is an example. I love this picture because the, 
the dog is actually holding himself back. It's kind of funny. Uh, like I said before, most aggression cases, it's not because they're being nasty and mean, it's because they've, they've been socialized poorly and they're scared, they, and they have some fear and uneasiness and anxiety about certain things. So this dog doesn't like the mailman or is scared of the mailman or probably anybody that's on a bike. So what this dog does is he barks and, and lunges at him, he's learned that that makes that scary, anxiety-inducing thing go away. And so uh, that's why they do that. So when you, if you have a problem like this and you hire someone like me to do training, what we would do is we would work from a distance. And we use that clicker, and we, when the dog would perk up and look at that thing that's normally scary, we'd click and we'd give them a treat. And that's where the clicker is so important because it's, it's, it's telling them, oh, because they already been conditioned to the, the click, and the click means a treat is coming. Uh, and it's usually something really freaking good, like doggy crack, something like uh, uh, steak or, or hot dogs or cheese, whatever the dog really loves. So over time and with distance, we make the dog realize this is not so scary. And so that's how we work out problems like this, where the dog goes and starts to lunge at people or aggressively bark um, and that type of stuff. It's, it's, uh, and, and, and I've had, as a, my own personal experience, I've had great, um, great success with this, uh, rehabilitating these dogs. Um, let's see, and then there's the, uh, this is very important. Make sure if you have a family, don't give a pet or a cat or anything for Christmas. Uh, it, pets really do change people's lives. And uh, we just don't, um, you, want to, you, you want to have the whole family involved. And, it, and uh, you don't want a, a pet to change a person's life in the wrong way. They have to be ready, especially dogs, they have to be ready to spend the time and train and put in the legwork right at the beginning. Um, and that is pretty much everything in a nutshell.